Thank you all for your attendance um, and good afternoon um, to this uh, presentation uh, and session. We have uh, about an hour, so um, thank you for uh, your cooperation. Um, there will be a presentation, first of all, and then an opportunity to ask some questions. But before I introduce our very distinguished uh, guest, I'd like to invite, first of all, Pat Nocton. Uh, where's Pat? Uh, Pat Nocton, um, who is Executive Director of People and Organisation Development with the ESB, just to address us briefly. And I want to thank in advance, and I'll do it again, the ESB for their kind uh, sponsorship and support of this and this series of, of talks. Thanks, Pat. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to uh, <coughs> eat as little into the 60 minutes we have uh, as possible, but I'm really happy to be here today on behalf of ESB to welcome you to what is the fifth of, our, uh, of this series of lectures. Um, it's nice to see such a big crowd uh, here today. We have been working with the IIEA for 10 years now on a number of series of lectures on the broad kind of energy debate over that time. Um, the topic of the current series, of which this is number five, is the electric lifestyle, which focuses largely on the potential to enlarge the uh, role of electricity in the new energy future that we're all working to deliver. We have had over the series uh, very many uh, distinguished uh, and accomplished speakers, and today's speaker, Dr. Ernst uh, Moniz, must rank you know, at the very top one of the most influential uh, and uh, accomplished uh, speakers on the topic, a nuclear physicist uh, who has worked for many years in uh, MIT, uh, who was the 13th US Energy Secretary from 2013 to 2017, and who currently is the President and the CEO of the Energy Futures Initiative. So he's uniquely qualified to, I suppose, give a a really valuable perspective on the energy industry and where it's going. At ESB, we share the vision of the Energy Futures Initiative for an energy future that is cleaner, safer, more affordable, and secure. And uh, we believe also in the potential to significantly expand the role of electricity in that energy future. At our September session here, uh, Christian Ruby from Euroelectric shared some research uh, looking at the Paris 2050 targets. And I suppose that research supported the view that if we are to meet those targets, that the electricity share of energy consumption across all of the various sectors will have to increase from some 20% to something like kind of 60% of overall energy consumption. So at ESB, <coughs> We are preparing our business for that energy transformation. We're looking at a future large-scale, uh, low-carbon electricity generation. We're looking at transmitting that low-carbon electricity across networks that are much smarter to customers who are very, very different to current customers, customers who are much more engaged and active uh, in terms of their kind of energy relationship and indeed customers who will no longer be entirely consumers but will be in many cases uh, producing electricity on a small scale themselves. So it's a very, very different future. Our focus really is on investment in low carbon generation, very significant investment for preparing our networks for an all electric future where electric vehicles and heat pumps would be very much the norm rather than the exception. And we also have a tremendous focus on innovation internally and externally. Internally, we have initiatives like our incubation centre down in Dogpatch Labs, where we are looking at all of the new ideas that are coming to us really from our customers. And also externally, where we're working with about a dozen international utilities on the free electrons programme, where we're looking at accelerating new startups in the energy industry. And last year alone, we had 500 programs competing for support in that program, of which we're supporting uh, about 15. So we believe in ESB that the low carbon future is essential and achievable. 
we have redefined the very purpose of our company to playing a leading role, particularly in this society, in bringing that to being. And we, uh, we, we know that there is an immense challenge in bringing this message and this understanding out into the public in terms of the importance of addressing the carbon challenge, the urgency of doing so, the real kind of challenges in doing that, but more importantly, the ultimate societal benefits around success. And we really welcome being here today to hear Dr. Moniz in person, give his, his insight on these challenges. I also welcome the fact that during his three days in Dublin, he is engaging with uh, all of the, the main kind of media, uh, television uh, interviews, and making his own contribution to raising awareness of the challenges and the potential ahead in this society. So I'll say no more. I will hand back to the chair now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you to the ESB. Um, as Pat has said, Ernest Moniz was the 13th uh, US Secretary of Energy, serving, with, uh, serving in President uh, Obama's cabinet. He's had an absolutely, or is having, I should say, we well, be careful not to speak about people in the past tense. <laughs> is, At least in their presence. Well, exactly. <laughs> is having a, an absolutely stellar uh, career as a physicist, as an academic. He's crossed the threshold over and back from, from academic life uh, into politics and public policy and back out and back in, I think, on a number of occasions uh, in the course of his extraordinary career. And um, as Pat has said, um, he was Secretary of State for Energy for a number of years, very, very instrumental in the negotiations that led to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and also, it's worth saying, because unfortunately it remains uh, current, uh, was one of the um, negotiators, along with his colleague John Kerry, of the, um, the historic Iran nuclear agreement, um, which was also one of the headline achievements. I think I can say, of the Obama administration. So there's a lot we could say about you, uh, Ernest, but I think what we'd rather do is to hear from you. So right. please <laughs> take the stage, and then we'll have an opportunity to ask some questions afterwards. Terrific. Ernest Thanks, Manila. Gentlemen. Well, thank you, uh, Pat and, uh, and Alex. And, and actually, both of you mentioned uh, my service as Secretary of Energy until 2017. I do want to emphasize uh, that was until noon on January 20th of uh, 2000, 2017. Uh, and I think, apparently you all know what that means. Uh, the, um, uh, and also the IIEA, uh, uh, it's been a, been a pleasure uh, to be here and, uh, uh, and uh, we were just discussing maybe there's gonna be some opportunity for collaboration uh, going forward uh, uh, since we are uh, some kind of sister think tanks uh, uh, in this clean energy space. So today, uh, again, I'll talk about global energy challenges, and, and actually, to tell you the truth, I think <laughs> I'm going to repeat a lot of what Pat, I think, uh, uh, said today, but uh, what I would say is certainly the overarching uh, energy challenge is uh, I want to add the word deep decarbonization uh, of the energy system uh, in the advanced economies, uh, which would incorporate uh, United States and Ireland, a little bit different in scale, but, uh, uh, but um, the advanced economies in an unprecedented short transition period. Uh, so we really are talking about, uh, and I know Ireland has adopted uh, the goal, the objective of uh, something like 80% uh, decarbonization by mid-century. So again, it's not just decarbonization, but it is deep decarbonization uh, over, uh, over a few decades. Uh, and, and the reason why, of course, it was highlighted uh, recently again, uh, but uh, in a very public and effective way, I thought, by the last IPCC report uh, just a few weeks ago, basically, uh, that um, I think really brought out the differential impacts of even just one and a half versus two degrees, uh, two degrees centigrade. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say, I have to admit that uh, that even the, the two degree centigrade is not going to be a walk in the park, uh, to put it uh, mildly. And frankly, we are not on a trajectory uh, to, to get there. But I think the IPCC report kind of tells you we got to fight for every tenth of a degree uh, because it all makes, uh, makes a, a, huge, a huge difference. Uh, I just say that in my own uh, home city, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, uh, recently the, the, the mayor uh, came out with a long-term plan 
uh, in terms of adaptation. Boston, as many of you know, uh, since you probably all have relatives there, uh, the, the, uh, uh, we are a pretty Irish city, uh, the, uh, that um, we are on the water. <laughs> and, uh, and so the, it, it, I think the plan the mayor put out is just the right kind of thing. How do you, how do you reshape the, uh, the waterfront in ways that provide barriers to, to flooding, et cetera, while providing even more public access to the, uh, to the, to the sea, et cetera, terrific. And, uh, and there's a commitment of spending at minimum of 10% of the entire capital budget every year uh, for decades, acknowledging that that's probably an order of magnitude less than one needs to actually resolve the issue. So the scale of the adaptation challenge, uh, I think, is becoming also more and more recognized uh, um, uh, as we, of course, keep our eyes on mitigation. In fact, one other example I'll give from, from the United States in terms of the scale. Uh, I visited a few years ago, when I was still in the, in the government, uh, one utility in Florida called Florida Power and Light. You may know them. Uh, they, uh, they, have, they by no means serve the entirety of Florida. There's just one utility, one, one footprint. They have already spent $4 billion on hardening of assets against the uh, impacts of enhanced, enhanced storms, and that does not protect them against the, mo the monster uh, storms that, that we have seen recently. So it just, you know, there's so many of these examples where the costs of not mitigating are going to be just so overwhelming uh, and, um, and it's not clear the great social benefit of g having gone from a wood pole to a cement pole, but these are the kinds of things we're going to have to be doing uh, a lot of. The, um, so uh, the Paris, so going back to Paris, uh, uh, I'll just emphasize that the Paris goals, which we are uh, struggling uh, to keep up with, uh, uh, are a very important step. But again, to remind, they are in no way commensurate with the deep decarbonization goals that have to, that have to follow, and that's really, that's really the context in which uh, uh, I like to, to, to talk. Now, it's, there's some good news, uh, in my view, and the, the best news, and I will say this from an American perspective, is that despite a number of activities, uh, my own, my president's, President Trump's um, st uh, announcement about withdrawing from Paris, for example, uh, last year. Uh, we can talk about the results of the elections um, on Tuesday uh, in the United States. Um, but the good news is a lot of noise in the system. We are not going back from a low carbon future. And uh, what I would emphasize is that when the president made his announcement on June 1st of last year, it was just days uh, before the majority of governors of states who have been in the lead uh, reaffirmed their commitments or even strengthened commitments. Mayors of large cities, including large cities in so-called red states, the two largest cities in Texas, for example, made their commitments. And most important of all, about 1,700 business people came forward and said, we're, we're staying in the course. Because I think, frankly, anybody who has to worry about real capital allocations and the like um, with not two-year but 20-year time horizons recognizes uh, it is a very bad exercise in corporate risk management uh, to invest, say, in a high carbon future. Uh, so, so I think that the ground truth is that uh, we are and we will continue to be moving to, to low carbon, but of course we can't be Pollyannish in terms of the unresolved scale and scope and timing, and those are all central to uh, judging success because the climate clock um, uh, keeps ticking whether or not uh, we are taking the steps we need to uh, or, or not. But again, I think we should not lose sight of the fact that um, we are uh, making progress towards 
low carbon, low carbon future. I might also say that last year, on a personal level, uh, I, I was one of the attendees of a s small group uh, uh, of roughly 40% uh, global oil and gas CEOs, 40% major financial, play financial market players, a few other random people. I was one of those in that category, uh, meeting at the Vatican, uh, and uh, I think very encouraging about the confluence of the climate and the social justice agenda. Uh, now we have to translate that obviously into, into action, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic there. But the, now the question is what are the tools? And, uh, and I think the simple summary to me of those tools is a synergistic innovation in the technology, policy, and business model spaces. They are obviously connected. For example, business models will be much easier to uh, develop uh, aligned with a low carbon future if we have the right policy signals and the right technologies available. Uh, but really, uh, I want to posit that um, innovation across the board is going to be central. I'll spend particularly a, fo a focus on what I consider to be the core activity of technology innovation. Uh, and that includes what, I, what you might call platform technologies, like uh, IT and uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, you know, drones, uh, the telecom, we have a telecom regulator to be here, um, uh, five, you know, 5G, uh, uh, large-scale computation, all of these technologies that are not viewed as energy technologies per se, a major part of our success will come if in the energy business we are thinking about the innovations that integrate these fully into the energy sector. And we are only scratching the surface uh, on, that, uh, on that today. And then, of course, there are the specific uh, 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 energy uh, supply, distribution, and, and end, use, uh, end use technologies. And here, you know, there's, no, there's no doubt that we have made substantial progress, uh, as noted, for example, in the cost reduction of photovoltaics and wind and uh, LEDs, uh, efficient lighting and, uh, and batteries and the like. Um, uh, but what I want to discuss, and po I posit that, uh, the inno that those innovations are critical. We've got to keep pushing on them. We've got to deploy them uh, more broadly. But they still aren't enough. And we are going to need uh, brand new breakthroughs, new technologies, um, uh, if we, and I'll come back and discuss that more, uh, if we are to meet the deep decarbonization goals. At Paris, before, before going more specifically, at Paris, at COP21, uh, uh, everyone remembers uh, what was by definition the last uh, act of Paris, uh, namely the Paris Agreement. Uh, less well remembered, but I think, I'm prejudiced, uh, uh, admittedly, but I think very important was what happened on the first day of Paris. That was the day when the national leaders were there. The French were very clever in having the national leaders there the first day and not the last day, like Copenhagen, uh, and uh, so where they could screw around with the, the, the negotiations. Uh, so, uh, but on the first day, uh, the, um, yeah, I'm sorry, technical term, that's right. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, on the first day, 20 national leaders of 20 countries got up uh, on stage and announced what was called Mission Innovation. That's with a capital M and a capital I. Uh, and that, uh, that initiative was that those countries, which collectively represented roughly 80% of global uh, government-sponsored uh, energy, clean energy R&D committed to doubling those investments over a five-year ramp-up period. Now, we all know it's just like the Paris CO2 goals. You kind of get maybe halfway, uh, you know, it's, uh, to, the, to the goal that's set. But the point is, really, it was an acknowledgement uh, for the first time in the COP series, really, that technology innovation is absolutely core to meeting climate 
goals. Uh, and uh, and there's a lot of pro I can describe later on a lot a lot of progress there, but I think that's really that's really the message, the recognition that uh, and it's controversial. Uh, frankly, some environmental groups criticized the the this focus on the need for technology innovation, uh, using the argument that we already have all we need. All we have to do is have the will to implement it. And, and I, and, and apparently those national leaders, fundamentally disagree with that, with that statement, which is what we will spend a little time uh, uh, discussing. Now, the, uh, you may notice that when I said we've had these very significant cost reductions in things like PVs, uh, photovoltaics, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and wind, uh, including now, I would say, offshore wind uh, uh, progress in cost reduction, LEDs dramatic. I mean, more than a 90% cost reduction in less in less than a decade. Uh, uh, batteries cost kind of cut in half. Another factor of two uh, needed over the next the next decade, etc. A lot of I mean, those basically uh, are focused on the electricity system. Batteries obviously also have mobility, but uh, but uh, but storage and in in, uh, in electricity. And clearly, decarbonizing electricity, uh, and we heard some of that earlier from Pat, is an absolutely necessary condition to get to where we want to go. We have to pretty much fully decarbonize electricity. We also need to have significant success on the demand reduction side, uh, energy efficiency, conservation, and the like. Again, necessary but not sufficient. And as Pat also said, once we have the pathway towards very low carbon electricity, then we have to electrify as much as we can in other sectors. Uh, that would he gave examples. I'm in the middle of buying an air air cooled an air, an air heat pump actually, um, uh, and uh, uh, and of course uh, autom uh, uh, electric electric automobiles and, and the like. However, and I'm not going to argue about the 60 percent, uh, uh, but we need more electrification. But we have to remember that is not the full solution. Frankly, it's not, in my view, close to the full solution uh, to the challenge. Uh, because there are uh, many other sectors that are much harder to decarbonize. Uh, much of the transportation sector is not going to be electrified. Obviously, air travel is the obvious uh, uh, extreme example there, in my view, unless you want to fly in the solar impulse plane over the ocean, uh, like lying down on your back uh, alone uh, for a few weeks. Uh, uh, it's remarkable, by the way, but uh, not, not recommended. Uh, the, um, build, with buildings, we can see line of sight for electrification, but we do run into the enormous turnover time of, of, of the existing building, building structures, which is a big challenge. Industry. Uh, industry is, in my view, not going to be you know, fully electrified. Uh, the uses of high temperature heat, for example, uh, uh, it, it's just not, it's not going to work. As you all know, in this country, more than in my country, agriculture isn't exactly a simple sector uh, to, uh, to decarbonize. So when all is said and done, uh, what I'd say is the, um, uh, you know, we need very low carbon electricity. We need very low carbon fuels. And we need very low carbon heat. Uh, and we are much more advanced on the first of those three than we are on the, uh, on the last two. Now, let me talk a little bit, I'll come back to that a little bit, but let me talk first about kind of this, this, this transition. Because uh, I will also, and this may be a little bit controversial, but uh, I think we cannot forget the role of natural gas uh, as a transition, a bridge, whatever, whatever words you want to use uh, 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 there. Uh, in the United States, 
uh, we have reduced national carbon emissions in the last decade by 12, maybe 13 uh, percent. Over half of that is the substitution of gas for coal. Uh, and our, our coal use has gone from 50 percent to below 30 percent, uh, replaced by gas and, and renewables. Uh, and so there's a lot of controversy over uh, uh, fracking. Uh, um, uh, and of course, it was the combination of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing that led to the incredible gas revolution that certainly, certainly in the states we have. Of course, Ireland, major gas dependence as well. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the enormous increase in production of, of, of gas uh, also influencing our export potential with, uh, with LNG. And again, that's going to, uh, when I was secretary and, and, and approved the export licenses uh, for LNG, a major part of it was the likelihood that a lot of that LNG was going to be displacing coal in other countries, and certainly that's the case in, in, in China. So, um, uh, in fact, uh, sorry, a little, a little bit random here, but the, the, the revolution uh, there also in the LNG markets is because there also have been business model evolutions. Uh, so, for example, the fact that we now have LNG contracts that are that are do not have destination restrictions, that are ba that are not based upon indexing to oil prices, is dramatically changing and growing that market, especially in Asia, especially in China, and especially in reducing coal use uh, there as well. So, so I think you know this is a, this is an example uh, uh, of something we also have to think about. It's fine to think about where we have to be at the end, but we also have to think about how to get from here to there, and 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 this is important. You might be interested because I know these fracking discussions are always exciting in different countries. Um, uh, the uh, a an exchange that you can find on the on the internet. Uh, in October of 2016, shortly before the presidential election in the United States, uh, an exchange between President Obama and Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, and, uh, and the president acknowledged in making the following statement that uh, this was an audience that was not going to be terribly receptive uh, to his statement, but he said, look, I understand the issues with fracking, and we have to minimize the environmental footprint. Keep working on getting that down. But he also then said, let's get real. We're talking about reducing CO2 emissions. We're talking about creating enormous numbers of jobs. To give you an idea, the low natural gas and natural gas liquids prices have led to something like $200 billion of capital investment in new manufacturing capacity in the Gulf Coast alone. And so what he is saying is, look, we all know where we want to be. We all know we want to be there today. But the reality is we've got to think about getting from here to there. And that includes the social issues in addition to the, to the technical issues. It certainly was the pragmatic approach that, that we took and that he took, and no one's going to call him uh, uncommitted to the to the climate agenda. So these are difficult discussions, and and they are going to stay difficult uh, for the next the next years. But it certainly is the reference frame that we think uh, we we need. Actually, an another uh, aside that I'll make is um, when I leave time for questions is uh, that uh, l let me we we did this at lunch a little bit, but let me repeat a little bit about the elections uh, two days ago. Uh, and just to say that in terms of this agenda, climate agenda, the fact that the uh, House of Representatives uh, changed uh, party leadership 
uh, is not going to magically uh, have a great climate policy discussion uh, and uh, law passed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I want to leave you with a more positive uh, 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 note. Uh, number one, there has already been established in the Congress a bipartisan consensus on supporting the innovation agenda, roughly speaking, just don't call it climate. Uh, in the public debate. But very, very good support uh, uh, really coming, and I don't think that's going to be, be, be affected, number one. Number two, when you look at the state results, uh, what you probably, in, in climate, what you probably read about most is the defeat, the rather handy defeat, of the Washington State Initiative on uh, having a carbon, uh, carbon tax uh, put in place. And it's true, and that, that was the case. The word tax remains... Uh, toxic, um, but look beyond that. In five states, the new governor-elect or a state ballot initiative all have very, very strong increased climate commitments, renewable portfolio standards, clean energy standards, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so the reality is, again, states have been where the leadership has come in the United States. The footprint of the state commitments to very, very strong carbon reduction grew with the elections on Tuesday. So that's, that's I think, a little bit out of the, not in the news so much, but is something that should not be, uh, uh, should not be uh, ignored. So uh, again, going back to the, uh, to the hard to decarbonize uh, sectors, uh, as I said, we, uh, we need to go to uh, uh, low carbon electricity, fuel, heat, uh, if we are going to have uh, a chance at meeting the economy-wide uh, deep, deep decarbonization. This calls for maintaining a very, very broad portfolio of, uh, of clean energy uh, R&D. For example, just as one example, uh, hydrogen uh, could be uh, one of the ways of addressing many of these issues across, uh, across the board. Not, not just fuel cell for vehicles, but uh, heat and, 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 the, and the like. The, um, here, I want to go back to this idea of transition because if, if, electricity plus hydrogen is kind of a backbone of a very low carbon economy uh, in the future, once again, natural gas can be an important part of the transition. Because today, you know, the uses of hydrogen are growing dramatically, and by far the cheapest way of making hydrogen today is steam reforming of natural gas. So as one vision, potentially, one can see this being a way of developing the market uses of hydrogen. Then one can add to that carbon capture and sequestration, and then you have carbon-free hydrogen, if you can manage the sequestration. And then you can imagine innovation and there's lots of opportunity for innovation, dramatically reducing electrolysis, carbon-free electricity-driven electrolysis of water to hydrogen and oxygen. So that's one example of a vision that is clearly technologically possible. It's going to be a question, again, of working at it much harder than we are and getting the cost down uh, to where these are uh, important, important substitutions. Now, having said that, with my uh, physicist's uh, back-of-the-envelope calculation, uh, I would argue it still isn't enough. We will still not get to deep decarbonization when one includes the, the, the social realities. Uh, we, will we really be able to deploy low-energy density technologies like solar and wind as much as we would need? And that's a separate question from storage. It just takes a lot of space uh, to, uh, to do that. Or will we be able to build 
uh, especially for the United States, this is quite relevant. Will we be able to build a real continent scale transmission system, move the wind to the load centers? I can tell you from direct experience, this is not easy, uh, et cetera. So again, we need the technologies to provide the optionality to overcome the various challenges that one faces in different countries, in different regions of my country, in different, uh, in different geographies and, 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 the, uh, uh, and the like. So I think this is, we still need more options. And what that means uh, to me is we are going to need very large scale carbon management, direct carbon management, in addition to these supply and end use uh, and, uh, and distribution uh, technologies. The, uh, what this amounts to is some form of carbon capture, utilization, and or sequestration. Keep the carbon out of the atmosphere or literally take it out of the atmosphere in what's called direct air capture. The carbon capture can be, as I've been implied, it can be from concentrated sources. And by the way, we have spent far too much attention in the transition sense in carbon capture from coal plants. That could be important in the future, but it's expensive. It's much cheaper to capture the carbon from industrial plants. Today, that is done in the United States and uh, is, even with no carbon price, is not very far out of the money because it's much cheaper to capture CO2 from a variety of industrial plants. So it's concentrated sources, but it's also d dilute sources, sometimes known as air, uh, where it's way more expensive uh, today. I'll, I'll come back to that. But we've got to either, we've got to keep carbon dioxide out of the air or take it out of the air. Utilization. Today's utilization method is very limited, enhanced oil recovery. People, most people don't realize that today in the United States, 300,000 barrels of oil per day are produced by CO2 injection into reservoirs. 60, 60 million tons a year of CO2 are used. That could be amplified by maybe, maybe an order of magnitude, but will be very geographically limited in a global sense. So we really need to go to another form of utilization, which is to be able to make very large scale commodities like fuels, maybe building materials uh, out, of, uh, out of CO2. We know it could be done in the laboratory. We are not even close to having that as a scalable, affordable technology. An example of where we need a lot of innovation and some scientific breakthroughs. Then you come to sequestration. Well, you can put it all underground, so geological sequestration, but there's also the option of biological sequestration. For example, engineering biomass to have much deeper root systems, things of this type. All of this requires big breakthroughs. That's why I say, going back to what I said earlier, it's great that we're working on these technologies that we see in front of us, and we need to do that, but it's not enough. We've got to solve some of these other, other, uh, other, other challenges uh, to, uh, to get there. Now, I mentioned that something like direct air capture is, now gets to be quite pricey. There's various estimates. Let me just say $500 a ton for the uh, capture which sounds, sounds like sticker shock. Why would you ever do that? Well, if you run, and you may have done it here, the Institute, I'm not sure, we have done it. Uh, if you run economic models that try to accomplish, to give you a scale, try to accomplish this deep decarbonization through the mechanism of a direct carbon price, 
you will get numbers in the $500 to $1,000 range per ton. Now, the, obviously, the idea is to not to have to get there. But what I'm telling you is don't dismiss direct air capture uh, yet. Uh, clearly, you, you want to work that price down just like everything else through, through innovation. But I'm telling you, but, you know, that, that's kind of the, the world that may be there. But, of course, e even if you have to pay a large price on the margin in a deeply decarbonized world, you're not doing it for very much carbon. So the total cost can still be manageable. So I don't know the answer. All I'm saying is I, don't think, I think nobody knows the answer. But if we're going to have deep decarbonization, we better have a lot of scientific and technical breakthroughs and as broad a set of tools as we can, as we can think of. Finally, let me just end um, with uh, some comments on, uh, on this idea of synergistic uh, technology, uh, uh, business model, and, and policy uh, innovation, and the whole idea of carbon, carbon pricing. Uh, uh, on the first, let me go back again and use the development of, of unconventional natural gas uh, as an example uh, in the United States. This was a 25-year process. It started with government support for some basic work in characterizing reservoirs that could produce unconventional natural gas. It moved on to a public-private partnership in the sense of an, a, a regulatory, a FERC for the experts, a FERC-allowed fee, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a FERC-allowed surcharge on interstate gas commerce to support a demonstration program of producing from these kinds of reservoirs that had been characterized by the federal R&D investment. And at the same time, Congress putting in place a time-limited tax credit for producing the gas. So all those things, I mean, that to me is uh, a beautifully designed program, including the time limit on the tax incentive, not open-ended, uh, which then led to opening, opening up this field. That's the kind of thinking that I think we need to do uh, to really stimulate uh, major, major moves as we had in the natural gas production. But clearly, tax incentives or carbon prices are, are important, and, and, and I will end by just talking about one particular initiative in the United States, which importantly in, our, in the context of our earlier discussion is put forward by very distinguished Republicans who served in high positions in the United States government. George Shultz, uh, the former Secretary of Everything, including State, uh, uh, Jim Baker, another former Secretary of State, Hank Paulson, uh, former Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and, and others. What they have done is say, okay, we need a system that obeys four principles. One, it must have a price on carbon that is sufficient to move the needle. They propose something in the, to start in the $45 to $50 per ton range. I think a number that's been discussed here in Ireland uh, uh, recently, a similar, similar number. Uh, secondly, it must be socially progressive. And for that, what they propose is take all the funds, and by the way, 50 bucks times, let's say, 5 billion tons is a fair amount of change. Uh, the, what they say, what George says is, whatever you do, don't let the government get its fingers on it. I say that to all of my government friends here. Um, divide it up into, into an equal dividend for everybody and send them a check. And that is progressive. The lower 70% of the income distribution would come out ahead. Third, reduce all other technology incentives and eliminate at least some part of the regulatory basis. Obviously, 
kind of for business. And fourth, and the one for which, frankly, there is not a good solution, is something that has a border adjustment on carbon until there's a uniform system across countries to avoid especially leakage of industry from higher carbon price to lower carbon price. So that's the kind, again, it's not, it's not perfect, and as I said, the, the border adjustment is something that still needs a lot of thinking as to how you would do it, but I think that's the kind of thinking we need uh, in terms of, it can't just be focused on carbon price, it's gotta have all those other elements come together. And I think it's coming together, and certainly in the United States, when this is coming from a set of distinguished Republicans, it gives me hope that we can have, uh, not in the next couple of years, frankly, but, but, um, but in the succeeding decade, uh, I think we will find uh, the United States actually moving to something like this kind of a system uh, that will uh, then be a tremendous spur to the technology innovation uh, 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 as well. So um, that's kind of my picture of where we are and what we need to do, and, um, and uh, it's been a great pleasure the last couple of days learning also what's going on here in Ireland, and, uh, and I'm happy to certainly to take, some, take some questions. Thank you very much.